Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Nadia Ali. I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies here at Brown University. And it's my great pleasure to introduce and welcome to you to welcome today uh, Professor Ruba Saleh. Uh, professor Saleh is our second uh, Mahmoud Dawish visiting professor in Palestinian studies. Uh, we are hosting three um, female Palestinian professors of Palestinian studies at Brown, uh, Rima Hamami, Ruba Saleh, and Noura Erakat. Professor Ruba Sala is um, she's professor at the Department of Anthropology and Sociology at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Her research interests and writing cover transnational migration and diasporas across Europe, the Middle East and North Africa, Islam and gender, the Palestine question and refugees. She has been a visiting scholar at the University of Cambridge and at Car Foscari University of Venice. Professor Saleh Ruba is the author of Gender and Transnationalism, Home, Longing and Belonging Among Moroccan Migrant Women. And I should say that I've known um, Ruba for a very long time um, when we are both PhD students um, in the late 90s and uh, at the time Ruba was working on the book. She's also author of Musulmane Rivelate, Donne Islam Moderneta, which uh, won the Premier Posada Prize in 2011. Currently, she's working on a book on the aesthetics of waiting and the politics of return among Palestinian refugees, which is to be published by Cambridge University Press. Among her many publications are two co-edited special issues with Sophie Richter Devro, one of them Palestine and self determination beyond national frames, emerging politics, cultures, and claims in the South Atlantic Quarterly, published in 2018, and cultures of resistance in Palestine and beyond on the politics of arts, aesthetics, and effect, which was in the Arab Studies Journal in 2014. Welcome, Ruba. It's wonderful to have you here today. So um, Ruba and I will be in conversation for about 40, 45 minutes. Um, you're welcome to leave your comments and questions in the Q&A function and uh, hope to have some time towards the end for discussion. So Ruba, um, when I look at your work over the last years, I see that um, in your overall work on Palestine, you are challenging us to think of Palestine beyond national and beyond nationalist frames. What does it entail for you? First of all, thank you very much, Nadia. Thank you very much, Barbara, and everyone who helped um, <clears throat> organizing this event and the, the one taking place next week. I'm very grateful for um, the honor that has been given to me and to carry this title. Mahmoud Darwish, visiting professor, is uh, both very moving and very um, a kind of a heavy duty. <laughs> so first of all, I, I really wanted to thank you for giving me this opportunity. And so nice also to, um, to be here with you. Um, thank you for the question, which really allows me to, um, to take a step back um, and to give a sort of a, <clears throat> a framing for what um, is the topic of today's um, conversation, uh, which revolves around nature ex extinction and um, what the Anthropocene can, can mean in the context of uh, a settler colonial context like the one um, of Palestine. Um, and the reason why I'm saying this is really a good, a good opportunity to you offer me um, for my framing is because I think for a long time, as you mentioned, I've been interested in looking at uh, trying to break, maybe breaking the, um, the notion of homeland into the two sections or the two sectors that this notion um, uh, entail, that is the relationship between home and land. Um, and to me, this is really important, not only because I think by doing so, we are collecting uh, the, 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 the request and the legacy of uh, feminist anthropologists of Palestine and particularly of refugees, for example, 
Rosemary Zayeh, who, who is a pioneer feminist ethnographer of Palestinian refugees, who suggested long time ago that there is in Palestine studies a need to historicize the whole gender and sexuality by precisely registering the narratives, the actions, the gaps, the silences that nationalist traditions and nationalist um, understanding of our history and practices uh, might raise. So in other words, I'm, for a long time, I've been interested in, in looking at what kind of um, possibilities and potentialities thus breaking homeland into home and land offer. Uh, and I see um, the idea of, of, of home as, as, a, as a horizon that allows us not only to, uh, to understand the stakes that are there in the loss of, of home and homeland uh, and, and the different ways in which particularly uh, women narrating their losses uh, focus on, on a history of a home that is lost, that is the villages of 1948, the losses that uh, the Nakba and following that the Naksa and the many other um, histories of displacement um, that these women have endured point to, but it's also the ability of um, particularly women as a lot of my work focuses on women, the ability of women to constantly remake these homes away from home. Um, and how do they do that? It, it is by looking at how um, sort of the, 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 the way that women were protagonists of constantly reformulating, rebuilding shelters, rebuilding a sense of protection, a sense of meaning of life in the present time of dispossession and displacement. Um, and beyond the nostalgia for, for that, that a lot of iconography of Palestine study has focused on, like the, the nostalgia for the loss uh, of 1948 villages and, and land. So there is a sense in which, uh, for me, on the one hand, accounting for the loss of home and the remaking of home uh, is, is crucial. In, and, and in the same way, it is crucial to account for the other meanings of land beyond the, uh, the idea of land as uh, a material and which is still really absolutely crucial. I don't want to deny, of course, the, the, the importance of the materiality of land and its loss. But there is another meaning that um, it is related to the affective, symbolic and uh, ontological notion and conceptualization of land, which is what I focus on in, in my recent work on the relationship between indigeneity and nature in Palestine. Yeah, well, thanks so much. So yeah, which you know leads us right into the work that we want to discuss and focus on. So when you move beyond the nation state frame, um, which, seems to lead you to look more carefully at the idea of the Anthropocene in relation to settler colonial contexts. And, and you wrote about the extinction of nature in Palestine. And I, um, I think you did this collaboratively with an expert in international politics of climate change. So I was hoping you could start out by explaining to us what the Anthropocene, uh, Anthropocene actually means and what is usually attached to it in relation to this idea of universal human extinction. And then I guess following up on that, how does a settler colonial lens contribute to or challenge prevailing ideas around the Anthropocene? Yes, thank you Nadia for the question. Um, <clears throat> I think um, scholars of the Anthropocene, which obviously is not my main area of expertise because I come from the topic uh, through a very fertile collaboration, but um, um, it, it is a sort of um, um, collaboration that allows me and allowed me to look at Palestine through a new lens. But I think that, that you know, to answer your question, the notion of the Anthropocene has been, of course, um, very much uh, central in our, uh, in, in the last decade or more, given that uh, we are uh, told that we are facing, as you mentioned, a universe, like the risk of the extinction as a species. Um, so basically the notion of the Anthropocene, which is both a descriptive notion, but also a very pres prescriptive one, implies that um, as humans have become decisively entangled in natural systems in, uh, in a way that affect climate and, uh, and in a way that 
allows human to make imprints on the planet to put a signature, a very violent signature, they also simultaneously have become in this process a geological species agent, which is aware of its place in the deep history of planetary time. Um, at the same time, this notion points to the ways in which, uh, because of this, um, the, uh, and because of the global so-called impact of so-called human activity on earth systems and on the planet, any sharp distinction between nature and a human actor or spheres have become um, unsustainable. Uh, however, as you pointed out, this mainstream understanding of the Anthropocene is very much criticized and um, um, in a way um, reversed by scholars um, who have been looking at the violent erasures uh, of settler colonial enterprises historically. In fact, a lot of the scholarship coming from um, indigenous brown and decolonial scholars has pointed out, and not only I have to say, has however pointed out uh, that um, actually the Anthropocene is rooted in histories of settler colonial violence and is leap, therefore deeply tied up with the dispossession and extinction of indigenous life words. Um, in fact, there is a lot of the discussion and contention around which date would signal the beginning of this process of human imprint on the earth. And um, the, the settler colonial, so-called settler colonial literature, if you wish, points to the idea that it's actually not, an, not incidental that uh, it is probably uh, 90, uh, 1492, the, the, the date when the conquistadores first set foot in South America that best probably signals the beginning of this year. And why so? Because the arrival of settlers uh, and, and of the violent uh, conquista of South America set in motion processes of violence, of disease, that actually decimated native populations by around 90%. So we begin to see here, um, not only the relationship between settler colonialism and, 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 and the, the, uh, the changing, the changing of, of, of entire climates uh, globally, um, but also the relationship between colonial violence and um, indigenous the extinction of indigenous populations and of um, the relationship between indigenous and uh, their conceptualizations of nature. So um, what, um, what is really important also to point out here is the ways in which um, there is an assumption in this mainstream understanding of the Anthropocene uh, of a universal we, of a universal human species that is facing the threat of extinction uh, on the one hand. Uh, and on the other hand, there is an assumption that um, um, this um, Anthropocene epoch in which we are supposedly living pushes us to reinterrogate our relationship with nature. In other words, we are intertwined with nature in a way that has never been uh, so evident before. And, um, and this is the reason why we as species uh, are called upon to, to, to do something about it. Now, obviously, um, having mentioned the, the, the triggering date of, uh, of what, according to a decolonial scholarship, um, the Anthropocene should be sort of located into this particular time frame, we begin to see the, the aporia of this kind of uh, mainstream understanding of Anthropocene. First of all, uh, not only there is an assumption of a human species that is um, that erases um, <clears throat> hierarchics, hierarchical understanding and hierarchical constructions of the human that happen because of colonization of the colonization of most parts of the world, but also there is a, there is the erasure of the relationship between the the. the the, 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 the knowledges and practices of indigenous communities around the world, whose relationship with nature has been always uh, very much part and parcel of um, a way of living that is absolutely erased in, in this understanding of the Anthropocene. Um, so in my work, together with Olaf Kari, I take the view that um, this notion of the Anthropocene could be and should be reinterrogated 
starting from the view of what I call the already extinct. And I know that uh, I will have the opportunity to talk a little bit more about this a bit later in, 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 in the conversation. Um, so what I want to underline here is that not only um, the set, settler colonial violence and erasures, erasures is, um, has been intertwined with uh, the ways in which certain humans have um, altered and erased entire life words in, in some parts of the world, but also the way that this process has produced in itself a hierarchy of classes of entanglement between human and nature. Um, in other words, <laughs> who is human and what is nature is not the given, but is the result of settled colonial ontological constructions of, of, of classes of humanities uh, and the relationship with the natural world. Mm, I see. Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, that uh, reminds me of um, so Dipesh uh, Chakabati, and you refer to the work, talks about the possibility that when faced with extinction, humans might develop an ethical consciousness as a virtue that allows overcoming of the common threat we face. I mean, you, you were kind of putting it in different words uh, earlier, but what is your take on that, on this idea of this ethical consciousness? Well, I think um, I'm, I'm indebted to the reflection of Deep Deepesh Chakrabarti in his Thunder Lectures, where he draws upon um, another epochal, another time in history where we, supposedly we as humans faced the risk of extinction, which was around the 1950s when uh, <clears throat> the whole nuclear <coughs> epoch was um, unfolding in front of our eyes and uh, the violence of nuclear war um, was um, unfolding with the, the end of the Second World War. Um, so um, Deepesh Chakrabarti borrows his notion of ethical consciousness from philosopher Carl, Carl Jaspers, who coined it actually in the 1950s precisely while contemplating the potential and imminent destruction of the planet by the atomic bomb. And um, he conceives of um, this notion of ethical consciousness as the possibility that faced with extinction and with the understanding of our very limited um, place in the sort of deep history of, 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 of the planet, we could retrieve a sense of ethical, pre-political consciousness that can take us away from geopolitical divisions and what he calls intra-human politics or political conflicts. Now, um, for him, ethical consciousness is a horizon of action, uh, a thought space, and I quote him, that came before and above and beyond politics without, however, sh uh, foreshortening the space for political disputation and differences. Um, and for Chakravarti, this idea of you know, contemplating our extinction and the, what it has to trigger in us um, remains, in his view, a, a thought experiment on, in the face of an emergency that requires us to think in novel ways about our present and future and novel ways about how do we compose the common. However, I think that coming into the topic from the viewpoint or for the vant from the vantage point of the colonized or what I call the already extinct, or through the lens of decolonial indigenous thinkers, means acknowledging that rather than a single species impacting upon nature, as I mentioned, and threatening ex extinction uh, for hu universal humanity, it is actually more appropriate to, uh, to argue that the very possibility of human and non-human life is determined by past and ongoing colonial architectures of power. So this, more, this what, what Chakrabarti calls sort of the, the, the possibility of an ethical, pre, pre or post-political ethical consciousness that should bring us together. Um, that is to say a mood of common vulnerability in our view, and this is what we do in this work, in this article we published um, in Environment and Planning, in our view is um, a, mode of, uh, a, mode, a mode of common vulnerability that must reinforce and expand, if anything, rather than suspend or defer our attention to local and time-bound injustices. 
And in fact, we argue that recognizing such injustices that settler colonial enterprises um, create should be a necessary prelude um, to facing in this ethical mood, the common threat we face mm. as a species. So we cannot really think of human extinction without recognizing that not only we belong, we have been created um, in, um, as different uh, classes of humanity because of a very violent uh, mm. process that uh, has taken place across the globe, across history. Uh, but also um, we have to pay attention to the, the ways in which, as it has been the case in Palestine, indigenous populations have historically been and continue to be dehumanized, disposed of and violently erased or consigned to uh, a space of non-life. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that sense, um, have already been extinct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I understand that. So what you're also contributing to is really a kind of new understanding or an expanded understanding of settler colonialism. I mean, so especially, I mean, settler colonial, colonialism in relation to pa uh, Palestine. So, so you argue, uh, if I'm understood rightly, that Palestine, and you said that before, has been studied most in relation to the displacement of the native population, uh, but then go on to say, well, that is not enough to, to understand the work, the complex work that settler colonialism does in Palestine. So what does analyzing settler colonialism through the lens of nature add to our understanding of the Palestine question? Yeah. But first of all, I, I think that uh, something that um, would allow me to elaborate upon this, um, and I find very useful, is a quote that I would like to bring and forgive, you know, forgive me for the Lent, is a quote uh, from the very well-known book by Ber Meron Benvenisti, uh, which was published in 2000, uh, titled Sacred Landscape, The Buried History of the Holy Land Since 1948. Um, and there is in this book a very evocative quote by um, Joseph Weitz, uh, who was um, um, a Polish uh, Jew who sat in the first and second transfer committees between 37, 1937 and 1948, and uh, who, um, and these committees were formed to deal with what was coined at the time as the Arab problem, um, as it was defined the presence of uh, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians on the land that the UN uh, attributed to uh, Israel in 1947. And Joseph Weitz was also the director of the Jewish National Funds uh, <coughs> Land Settlement, Settlement Department from 1932 to 1948. Um, and allow me to bring in this quote because I think it's really what uh, gives me uh, an, a possibility to, to then analyze what, what the stakes are. Um, Joseph White, White writes the following. And the road continues eastward between mountains and over mountains. And the Galilee is revealed to me in its splendor, its hidden places and folds, its crimson smile and its green softness and its desolation. I have never seen it like this. It was always bustling with man and beast. And the latter, the latter predominated, herds and more herds used to descend from the heights to the valleys of the stream beds, their bells ringing with a sort of discontinued sound, which vanished in the ravines and hid among the crevices, as if they would go on shimming forever. And the shepherds striding after them like figures from ancient times, whistling merrily and driving the goats towards the trees and bushes to gnaw at them hungrily. And now the picture has disappeared and is no more. A strange stillness lies over all the mountains and is drowned by hidden threads from within the empty villages. An empty village, what a terrible thing. Fossilized, fossilized lives, lives turned to fossilized whispers in extinguished ovens. A shattered mirror, moldy blocks of dried figs and a scrawny dog, thin-tailed and floppy, eared and dark eyed. At the same time, at the very same time, a different feeling throbs and rises from the primordial depths, 
a feeling of victory, of taking control, of, re of revenge and of casting off suffering. And suddenly the whispers vanish and you see empty houses, good for the settlements of our Jewish brethren who have wandered for generations upon generation, refugee of your people, steeped in suffering and sorrow as they at last find a roof over their heads. And you knew war, this was our war. So I think this quote, long quote, actually lends itself to um, understanding the stakes of the colonization of Palestine. Um, some of the issues I've talked about um, um, up until now um, around the, the way in which the settler colonization of Palestine um, brings with itself a, a recasting, not only the erasure and the destruction of the uh, previous uh, life words, but also um, the construction of um, the indigenous um, and the indigenous relation to nature as, um, as a non-life, as the barren space, as, as a fossilized uh, entity that is a non-life entity. And um, I think this is really important because um, it allows us to understand that at stake in settler colonialism, and Palestine is no exception, um, is not just um, <clears throat> um, a sort of um, elimination of the native, the logic of elimination of the native. And um, when I talk about elimination here, I don't at, at all um, mean, and never I use the word um, genocide or biological, uh, extinction of the native, but at stake is a sense in which um, the life world, the, the, the entanglement of the indigenous population to their nature, and the very, the very notion of what is and wh when does nature emerge is at stake. Nature only emerges in the moment in which the colonizer uh, appropriates the land mm -hmm. and makes the desert bloom as the famous um, mm -hmm statement wants it. Um, but also I think that in Palestine, like in many other such colonial contexts, the elimination of the indigenous or the erasure or the, 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 the dis displacement of the indigenous population rested on much more than just the physical displacement of the people and um, rested on much more than the destruction, the ecological alteration of the landscape. Uh, there is precisely this drawing of an equivalence between indigenous life um, <clears throat> and non-life with human and non-human together fossilized or desertified by the ongoing settler colonial project, which actually, and this is really crucial, uh, we shouldn't forget the, 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 the lesson of settler colonial scholarship, like for example, Lorenzo Veracini or Patrick, the late Patrick Wolf, that, um, uh, describes and analyzes such colonialism, not just as a process of appropriation or, and, and dispossession, but as a process by which um, the settler colonial wants to make itself into the new indigenous. And in this process has to uh, not just appropriate, dispossess, erase uh, the indigenous population, but has to make itself into the indigenous. Mm. Uh, or the yeah. indigenous population. Yeah, I was uh, Ruba, I was struck by um, the title um, that you suggested for this talk, um, which uh, points to a view from the already extinct um, in relation to debates about the Anthropocene. So I, I was wondering if you could tell us what you mean by that. Are you are you saying that Palestinians are extinct? I suppose not. Of course, I'm not at all. Yeah. Uh, we are far from extinct, yes. <laughs> lucky. Uh, so as I was trying to hint at earlier, um, obviously the notion of extinction is, 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 in, is in this context, re context referring to the extinction of indigeneity or the attempt at making the indigenous life world extinct. In other words, obviously, uh, and we, we began this discussion and conversation by pointing to the many offerings that this connecting land, home from land may offer. And looking at the notion of land, 
by not just the lens of land dispossession and repossession, but through the kind of um, a possibility that interrogating uh, what kind of the, ont the ontological constructions that went on in, in, in such a colonial um, violent practices um, uh, can offer us in terms of our understanding of the Palestine question and, and, the, and, and the forms of um, uh, kind of um, extinction that this brought with itself. So referring to the late Patrick Wolf, of course, um, who argued that obviously extinction and settler colonialism are always connected in so far as land is life and therefore the expropriation and destruction or appropriation of land um, is necessarily um, a process of extinction um, and of death and destruction. Um, and insofar as land is, is, is life and at least land is necessary for life, appropriation of, of land is always about um, um, death. Uh, however, extinction in this context doesn't refer or doesn't equate to genocide or to death or physical extermination, mm. nor does it suggest, as I mentioned, um, that the Palestinian refugee community, for example, who constitute the core of um, the, the reflections that are um, present in the in, in, in the work that we are discussing today. Um, it, it does not therefore suggest that the Palestinian refugee community is biologically extinct. Uh, on the contrary, far from it. Uh, the point uh, I would like to make, and uh, I hope I'm, I'm going to be allowed to make this point, is that um, we should see, we should look at the afterlife of, uh, of nature in Palestine as a, as a life of resistance and a life of um, the proof, so where nature pr proves itself recalcitrant to, to its extinction. However, um, the making of the refugee problem is part of an ongoing process of forcing the extinction of Palestinian indigeneity. And um, an extinction in this, in this context, therefore, um, points to uh, a settler colonial process that started in 1947 with the settlers' attempts thereafter to make themselves into the indigenous in Palestine by forcibly erasing indigenous life words, as I said, and by consigning indigenous life words to a space of, uh, um, of, of, of non-life, to, to a barren, uh, inert, uh, non-living uh, and non and, and, uh, entity. Um, however, as I will, uh, argue later, uh, the, uh, my argument is that this process is, is unfinished and constantly may unsettled mm -hmm. by um, the unruliness of nature itself, mm -hmm. uh, which triggers novel practices um, mm -hmm. that uh, somehow um, make this process a constant dialectic and a constantly unfinished uh, project. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ruba, before sort of pursuing some of these conceptual ideas further, um, I mean, I know you're an anthropologist and I know that you have done, you know, in-depth ethnographic research. So I was hoping you could share some concrete examples based on your own personal recollections and ethnographic work that illustrate the wider conceptual points you're making, particularly in relation to the <coughs> and the destruction of natural and social habitats of Palestinian refugees. Yes, absolutely. I, I am um, very keen, in fact, to move on to some of the more ethnographic uh, dimension of these conceptual um, frames. Uh, but before um, doing that, I would like to just linger over uh, for a few more uh, minutes, for one minute or so, um, the, the ways in which I think um, the logic of extinction of indigeneity becomes very clear. And I would like to quote, for example, the words of Theodore Herz, who um, very clearly um, in, 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 in uh, you know, th these are quotes taken from um, um, a lot of uh, scholarship, both by Israeli scholars and Palestinian scholars um, who have before me and in, in many ways, even much more <laughs> uh, competently than, than I tried to do in, in this article, which actually 
really focuses on Palestinian refugees recollections of the natural world, very clearly have um, given us a sense of the stakes uh, um, of the extinction of indigenous life words in beginning in 1947. For example, Theodore Herz very clearly sets um, his, the, the settler logic of displacing and replacing, um, it, which comes out with an alarming clarity when, when he said, if I wish to substitute a new building for an old one, I must demolish before I construct. This is Theodore Herz cited in Patrick Wolf 2006. Um, and he offered a very clear understanding of what he meant by this, um, um, or the, the ecological imaginary that sustained this, what we call in the article, the emergence of a settler nature, uh, which included piercing, piercing the hills, establishing chemical industries, producing energy for driving machines. Um, so there is a sense in which this is Israeli ecological imaginary that sustained um, the, the erasure of the indigenous uh, population um, was very much sublimated in, um, in a logic of destruction and reconstruction, which very often also took the, took the, the image of um, an ecological and an environmental ethics. For example, uh, there is the whole literature on the environmental ethics um, of um, post-1948 and, and later of planting trees and planting forests but also through these practices, changing the whole landscape as Meron Benvenisti has uh, very eloquently um, showed us in his work and um, completely erase the indigenous landscape and bringing a new um, image and imaginary of uh, what the land um, should look like. Um, there was even attempts to engineer a European climate via um, afforestation. Um, and when in 1959 Israel passed the nature preservation um, goat induced damage law, um, it aimed at limiting grazing in order to engineer a shift to the so called ecological climax, which it was claimed was, um, had been prevented by practices of the indigenous communities such as grazing and herding. So um, I, I wanted to spend just a few more minutes lingering over the commonalities, like the, the many local anthropocenes that one can infer from such practices, if you wish. Um, there is a lot of really interesting works, Susan Slimovich and others, and a lot of uh, Israeli and Palestinian scholars who have really given us a wealth of scholarship that um, explores this dimension in, in many different ways. However, to go to your very crucial question about the imaginaries and the, the kind of uh, ethnographic uh, takes on the role of nature. Um, I, I was very struck when I started to, to, to reflect uh, on the role of nature by the very loud uh, absence of nature in the Palestinian scholarship, in, um, on Palestinian scholarship on refugees, despite the fact that both in my family's oral histories and, um, and in many of the interviews and work I did in, in, in and with refugees, the role of nature is actually, I mean, nature is quite ubiquitous in, in, in these recollections. Uh, there is a sort of um, inability to, to kind of look at this displacement in synergy with uh, the displacement of sort of the, the population and the natural world. Um, for example, um, my very uncle, when, when asked, you know, when he was a child in 1948 and he was only eight years old and uh, from Jerusalem and he was um, telling me the whole history of how, uh, you know, children in some cases were taken away to, um, to protect them from the violence that was ensuing and unfolding and asked like, where did you go? Where were the children taken? He would say, we were taken to the trees and we were, the trees would protect us we were put under the trees uh, or many other recollections where <clears throat> um, of, of um, uh, interlocutors who told me how <clears throat> a lot of, in many instances where people were trying to escape or seek shelter, the olive groves or the, or, of, or the citrus groves were providing a, a, a place to hide and to, to shelter from the ravages of war. 
Um, so there is that level of presence of nature. And of course there is the allegorical presence of nature in all of the Palestinian literature and iconography related to the memory and the scent and the sensory uh, recollection of the lemon trees and the citrus and the lands. And uh, my very mother's memoir focuses a lot on <laughs> pre-48 life as a, as, a, as, a, as a recollection of sensory and experiences of smell, of, of, of eating certain foods, of, of touching certain mm. you know, trees and so on. But my, my, um, my interest here is going beyond these kind of recollections and looking at how, um, in a way, um, the, the, the vegetation uh, that Israel sought to make extinct with the expulsion of what Meron Benvenisti calls the human landscape, become and has become the site of unexpected practices in the present, which reaffirm the indigeneity of the Palestinian refugee population. Um, so I'm interested in what the resurgence, the unruliness, the, 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 the ability of this nature to keep popping up uh, despite all odds, what can this popping up uh, affords and what kind of horizons and um, um, agency does this uh, propel. Um, so I can continue. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, examples that I would like to share with you. Um, yeah, maybe if you could um, share a couple of examples. We have yeah. one question that I will get to that question from the audience uh, after, but maybe you can provide a couple more examples. Yeah. So for example, I mean, first of all, let me, uh, in, 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 in this article I published, I tried to look at uh, diverse sources. So I'm, I'm looking at my own family recollection. I'm looking at Palestinian refugees um, recollections or, or over work I conducted for over 10 years in camps with um, a lot of different, in a lot of different places, but also on Palestinian scholarship and writings and renditions. And one such clear rendition, I think, uh, comes from, um, for example, the, the, the literature and the work of um, Palestinian intellectual uh, Raja Shehadeh, who writes about the experience of walking on the landscape of Palestine in at least two of his works. For example, Palestinian Walks, uh, his book, Palestinian Walks, notes on a vanishing landscape, which opens with the realization that the familiar landscape of Palestine with, it, with its olive orchards, with these traditional green terrace cultivations, with the white stones houses, which had remained unchanged for centuries, <laughs> have been altered. I mean, this, this kind of familiar landscape, which he says would have looked familiar to a contemporary of Christ up until not long ago, has, has been dramatically altered over the last uh, decade or so. Um, and he talks about um, sorry, um, his journey in another in, a, in another um, in another of his work. He talks the book title or the article title "A Rift in Time: Travels with My Ottoman Uncle," which was published in 2010. He he, he narrates the walking journey that he undertakes in the footsteps of his great uh, grand uncle a century earlier only to find that virtually none of the names, the places, the flora and the fauna described in his uncle's memoirs exist anymore. However, um, in Shihadeh's lyrics, um, he's, he, he, he stumbles upon this resurging vegetation, even though none of the names and the houses, the, 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 uh, the flora and the fauna exist any longer. There is constantly the stumbling upon this resurging vegetation the, the almond trees, the cactu cactuses, that in his own words, um, afford an ability to see what is no longer there. And affords him an ability to, to imagine that in that particular place, uh, there used to be a village or there used to be um, um, life that, it, that, that is no longer there. So in his own words, it, it affords him to see what is no longer there. But most importantly, um, it does not only does that job of bringing um, memory to life, it actually allows uh, an ability to reimagine the present. <clears throat> um, so it's not only the work of memory, but it's the work of what 
uh, this imagination that settler colonialism had sought to erase the power of imagining what the present could look like by restoring the past uh, has been curtailed as well. And this resurgent vegeta vegetation is what allows him to, uh, in, uh, with, that what affords him with an ability to reimagine the present. And um, it is what I have um, seen um, time and again um, uh, described in a lot of the practices of refugees, families who, until they could go back to their villages um, in, a, in a not too distant past, um, they would try and go and make the site of the ruins as a site of family visits, of rituals, of um, um, rituals that were not only and simply about reliving a past or uh, imagining um, or celebrating the, the existence of a pristine nostalgic <clears throat> memorialization of, of, of the natural world, but was actually made of new and novel practices triggered by the constant resurgent uh, vegetation that kept, up, kept popping up. And I'll give you an example. For example, um, there was a woman who um, told us the whole story of how her village, Al Walaja, which was the village that was the, um, uh, divided into two parts in 1948. One part remained in uh, present day Israel and the other parts uh, stayed in, in, uh, within uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, West, <laughs> the West Bank, the side of the armistice line. Um, the 40, 1948 part of uh, Walaja was destroyed um, and reduced into uh, ruins, but, um, and then the second part of the village, the part that stayed within the West Bank was seized when uh, the municipal boundaries of Jerusalem were redrawn in recent years. However, this, um, this um, interlocutor of mine um, narrative was very much uh, remembering the practices that until not so long ago, they, the, the family kept going back to al uh, to attend to the resurgent vegetation um, and around which they had built a shed where sometimes they tried to sleep in it and stay and re rebuild a sense of, of a life there. Um, the shed was destroyed because the Israeli had declared la the land as an agricultural land. And so the family decided to <laughs> cultivate instead. And so they continued going back until they were allowed to somehow or um, trespassing uh, the various uh, architecture of the occupation to attend uh, to the vegetation. And this um, kind of narrative has been um, repeated to me uh, time and again. Um, and again, it, it, it kind of allows us to, to make sense of um, the, the, the sort of ironic um, uh, pattern that in a way nature resists its, its obliteration. Uh, there is the sort of unruliness of recalcitrance that um, calls for new practices in the present and not just for a, an imagination of the past that is no longer there. Mm. Which seems to be something that Palestinian artists are more and more engaging with, no? Sort of this sort of new forms of imagination. And you're referring to this as a bit as well. Um, so I find that really fascinating. Um, we had a, I had a, um, also a conversation with uh, Gil Hochberg, who has written about you know, some of the, these new imaginations. But let me turn to the audience question now. Um, so Zina Aga is asking, how can we understand decolonization as a project of futurity when much of the destruction of nature that occurred in 1948 continues on into the present? Yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, it's uh, what I try to do here. First of all, in the wider work, uh, we never refer to 1948 as a finished 
uh, as, as a finished history, but it's uh, Nakba, Mustamira, <laughs> it's, it's the, the ongoing Nakba. Uh, so I totally agree with you about the fact that uh, we cannot talk about this as a, in the past tense, and that uh, the kind of um, insurgent practices that we see at work here are, are limited and are constantly repressed by the devising of novel forms of uh, repression and violence. However, I would like to answer this with, um, um, with um, an example <clears throat> by um, drawing from the work of Palestinian geographer Ghazi Falah, who I think um, has conducted a really interesting review uh, of the ruins of the villages of 1948 and has noted in his, um, in his work some ironic uh, consequences of uh, settler colonial attempts of erasure. For example, <clears throat> the fact that um, in the immediate aftermath of 1948, the Israelis built a uh, forest on the ruins to cover uh, for the debris. Um, and the, but but the, the fact that the forest kept growing uh, meant that after a while, it was no longer possible to destroy, to go in and finish the job of destroying the ruins of the, of the villages, because that would have meant destroying the, the vegetation as well. I think it's kind of ironic in a certain way, the idea that nature uh, has its own uh, logic that escapes um, the, uh, the, the escapes total control. And I know that in, in the face of the, of the sophistication of the violence that we are confronted with, this might be very mere consolations. But I also think that there are all kinds of ways in which Palestinians are resisting the erasures, the erasure of their indigeneity. Nature is, I mean, there are a myriad of projects uh, and of, scho of, of scholarship as well that is um, resisting this obliteration and affirming and um, confining the success of the settler colonial project of indigenization. And I think we shouldn't underestimate um, the success of these very partial and fragmented uh, types of resistances, but uh, I think they're still really crucial for uh, containing um, the, the, the process of expansion and of normalizing, finally, uh, the success story of Israel. And I, I also think that, for example, at every time that we claim, um, in this case, um, our own vegetation as the indigenous vegetation, our own um, the trees or embroidery as our own embroidery, uh, the, the, every time we claim um, the, the, the Palestinianness of certain types of food, and every time we inscribe um, these sets of uh, practices into our own indigeneity, we are exercising resistance and we are claiming our right to exist in the place and beyond. Yeah, unfortunately, we have um, run out of time, but maybe just to conclude. So you mentioned it a few times. So is this what you're talking about when you speak about the recalcitrance of nature, which you put also in connection with the uh, recalcitrance of indigeneity to erasure? I was wondering whether, you know, in the concluding couple of minutes, you can reflect a little bit on that. Um, can you re reformulate the question? Well, I mean, I uh, you have on several uh, occasions referred to this idea of the recalcitrance of nature, and uh, you've also speaking you're also speaking about the recalcitrance of indigeneity um, to erasure, and I was just wondering if you can uh, to conclude, and we just really have a couple of minutes, reflect a little bit on this idea of. Um, the, yeah. the connection and, and the idea of recovery. <laughs> yes, I, I, I think uh, the best way to conclude perhaps is to, um, to, 
um, to refer to a notion in, in Palestinian uh, language and uh, which is both um, a word and that denotes, uh, uh, this word is sabr, which um, uh, is both um, the Arabic name for the cacti fruit, but also means patience and also signifies endurance as a natural and human virtue. And in my view, the, the fact that um, this nature and the cacti fruit keeps uh, resurging despite attempts at obliteration and erasure um, represents something that is much more than a nostalgic claim to a pristine or an authentic life world that pre-existed the settler colonial intervention as um, a lot of the times we tend to um, um, remember but it precisely points to how indigeneity returns as a signify as sig and signifies an intimate form of reciprocation of native, pe native people to their vegetations, to their animals, an indigenous type of entanglement, which in itself proved has proved recalcitrant to its taming and to fossilization as the quote at the beginning of this conversation pointed to. So I'd like to finish perhaps by rem reminding ourselves of the powerful and evocative uh, meaning of this word sabr which means both patience and which mm -hmm. also refers to uh, the untamed uh, and recalcitrant nature of Palestine, particularly when it comes to um, the cacti fruits that signpost the, the past, but also uh, calls for novel forms of imagination, novel practices, novel types of return to sites that have been destroyed. And this is what I would like to call yeah. the, after, the afterlife of nature in Palestine. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks so much, uh, Ruba, for um, sharing your um, very original and insightful reflections in relation to the Anthropocene uh, nature and um, displacement in Palestine. We will, of course, be in conversation, not next week, but this Wednesday. Uh, please join us. Um, Ruba will be um, organizing, hosting, and participating in a panel discussion on thinking Palestine via Ferguson and Standing Rock, radical kinship, and the intersectionality of struggles. And this will be also online at 1.30 p.m. EST on Wednesday. But at this point, thank you very much, Ruba, and uh, also many thanks to the audience. And I uh, hope to see you all on Wednesday again. Thank you very much, Nadia. Thank you, everyone.